have two great presentations lined up. Sadly, the speakers can't be with us today, but we're in for a treat. I watched the presentations yesterday. They're pre-recorded. And they're very challenging, so that they will give us a really good start to then get us thinking about, you know, what are the challenges? How can we really think through what we want to take forward? So big picture this morning, this, this session is more about, okay, let's get more into the details so we can take something concrete forward. Okay, our first speaker is Professor Londa Schebinger. She is the John L. Hines Professor of History of Science at Stanford University. And Londa has asked us to refer to a slide where there was something missing. The slide number five refers to gendered innovations, which is an open access repository for research tools for scientists and engineers. And it will become clear when we watch the presentation. Could you start the presentation for us? So it's Professor Londa Schebinger talking to us about a challenge she sees in open research that she wants us to think about and address. Hi, I'm Londa Schiebinger coming to you from Stanford University. So I have been asked to speak on open research. Open research aimed at equity networks and outcomes requires inclusive research and intersectional research. And I've been asked to respond to the declaration that was circulated to us, and we've been asked to be provocative. The declaration is a good starting document. I see many points that aim to build an inclusive network. These are all excellent and aim to create equality among participants, aim to create diversity, inclusion, open publication, open governance, equity between the global north, the global south, and student de uh, demographics that reflect our population. These are all excellent and necessary. What I am missing is open principles for knowledge production. As you may know, Nature Magazine recently published a special issue on racism, what we in the US would call structural racism. Several articles there treated indigenous knowledge, something that I missed in the declaration. I have worked on indigenous knowledges, there are many, not one, for decades, so I was interested to see what the Nature articles had to say about it and open knowledge networks. I found that while the Nature articles discussed including indigenous people in Western style research using methods of participatory research, even co-creation, there was little about the epistemic merging of knowledge systems, i.e. merging different ways of knowing in knowledge production. I find this also a bit lacking in the declaration. We are welcoming inclusive participation. Are we also welcoming the divergent epistemes these newcomers may practice? Or are we similarly to the courts of law in the Amazon, specifically Ecuador, where to save their communities, the Quechua people must prove that nature in their community is of spiritual and cultural significance, but they have to prove that using the logic and rules of the law court and not the logic and rules of their own knowledge practices. That is my provocation. So let me turn now to the efforts that many of us have made to create knowledge that leads to equitable research outcomes. I would say that we are a massive network of people who have been attempting to broaden the epistemes of what I'll call Western science. So we know that, that this network of people have been working for decades to incorporate sex, gender, and now intersectional analysis into science and technology to promote equitable research that safeguards the environment and benefits everyone across the whole of society globally. And we've had many successes. Uh, you know that the EC recently requires everyone who applies for public funding from the European Commission to say whether sex, gender, and intersectional analysis is relevant to their proposal. And gendered innovations um, 
prepared this booklet on how to do that in an expert group that ran from 2018 to 2022. The U.S. National Institutes of Health also requires, as a requirement to receive public funding, that sex as a biological variable be included. And the NIH just held a marvelous meeting on the 26th of October, you can see the videos, about gender as a sociocultural variable to be required for public funding. Now today, I want to focus on the role of these funding agencies in open networks. Publicly funded research agencies such as the UKRI, the NIH, the European Commission, are funded by taxpayer monies and as such are responsible for promoting a qu a quality, relevant, inclusive, and equitable research that safeguards the environment and benefits, again, everyone across all of society globally. To better understand how this works, Gendered Innovations and colleagues did a global study of funding agencies across six continents, so across the global north and the global south, to and to expand our perspectives, we created a 14-member advisory board, again with representatives across six continents. This proved really invaluable to check our valuation instruments, assumptions, and priorities. We then invited 40 agencies to participate in our study, of which 22 agreed. It is our conviction that sex, gender, and diversity analysis, so on the advice of our advisory committee, we changed the term intersectional analysis to diversity analysis because this term was better understood internationally. So our conviction is that integrating sex, gender, and or diversity analysis into the design of research where relevant can lead to discovery and improve research methodology. Our goal was to foster equity and international collaboration, standard practices tailored as appropriate to country specific cultures and regulatory landscapes. We found that particularly important in East Asia. We think that this will enhance collaboration potential, global equity, and research excellence. So you can read about our study, which was published in Science on September 30th. So here are the agency scores. You see uh, this top line here shows you the aggregate scores. Only one agency scored in the top tier, a number of them in the second tier, and most agencies were clustered. They'd really just begun to get started. Now, agencies were interested in their scores, and we held many sessions with individual agencies to discuss their results. But we were not interested in the scores so much as in how to implement intersectional methodologies leading to greater equity in outcomes into funding agencies. And for this, I want to take you to our um, method here, and I will share our website where we have this. Um, and here you see our policy recommendations for major granting agencies. As part of this study, we developed this five-part roadmap for implementing such policies. Again, these funding agencies can tailor this process to their specific country cultures and to their regulatory landscapes, but at least they have suggestions of where to start. So the thing here is we have collected resources. You can click into the definition, into our first pillar, the first action funding agencies need to take. And we have collected all the definitions of these terms that we have found. And we also, either through our study or that we know of from um, other resources. And we've also suggested that these might be um, aspects that funding agencies want to ask for as well. Now, if we go back to, we see that for each of our five aspects that funding agencies need to do to implement really good policy here, you can see the proposal guidelines for applicants, and you can click here and see 
the emerging practices globally. We've collected all that information for people and so on and so forth. You can go through the entire process. Wow. So in conclusion, as we think about the knowledge equity network, I think we need to focus on knowledge. Whose knowledge? Have we truly captured traditional indigenous knowledges of the Caribbean Arawaks, the Arctic Inuits, the Australian Aboriginals, the Amazonian Quichua? Have we captured those knowledges in our brick and mortar universities? We are creating knowledge for whom and who benefits from that knowledge? These are my questions. Thank you very much. And the next presentation is from Rosalind Clark Artis, and it is really fascinating insight into the college she is the president of in the United States. It's a very unique higher education institution and incredible successes. Over to Rosalind. Good day. I'm Dr. Rosalind Clark Artis, president of Benedict College, a small, private, religiously affiliated, historically black college located in Columbia, South Carolina. The college enrolls fewer than 2,000 students, the overwhelming majority of whom are low wealth, first generation students of color. Our curricula are grounded in the liberal arts, but have migrated increasingly toward the STEM disciplines and professional degrees. The college is not an Ivy League institution, nor is it designated as a research one or even research two institution. However, despite its Carnegie classification and the significant and in some instances, severe resource limitations, including limited access to state-of-the-art laboratories and research instrumentation, the college soundly outperforms its peer institutions in faculty research productivity and undergraduate research engagement. Despite the relative success of Benedict College, many of you may be asking yourselves, what value my small, private, relatively unknown institution brings to the conversation around open science? Well, I'm glad you asked. You see, I believe that we are stronger together. That's more than a political slogan here in the United States. It is a paradigm shift in higher education that requires a marked departure from the singular possessive in favor of a plural collective. Open research is a credible intellectual framework that contemplates dissemination of results, widespread availability of data sets, and access to research and instrumentation for the good of the entire intellectual community. It goes without saying that knowledge creation would be more efficient if scientists worked together. The primary goal of an open science paradigm is to open up the process of knowledge creation and to make research and knowledge dissemination more efficient. Clearly, our current technological reality creates a fertile environment for data sharing, analysis, and yes, critique. Certainly, in our post-pandemic reality, we have found tremendous utility in the technology instrumentation and the ability to share across time zones, across countries, across cities, and across campuses to ensure collaboration and continued engagement in the scientific process, notwithstanding our ability to get to our labs, our libraries, and our on-campus facilities. Which brings me to my next point, open science shared science creates opportunities for questioning, critique, and collaboration. Emphasis on questioning and critique. In a sense, I might suggest that open science keeps us honest. But more than that, it ensures diversity of thought, ideas, and perspective. It should go without saying at this point that I am a staunch advocate for inclusion. Science demands that we view complex problems through a compound lens, which affords us the benefit of multiple perspectives. Therein lies the greatest incentive for open science. It allows 
Benedict students. Low wealth, minoritized, often marginalized students, the ability to make a contribution. It simply cannot be argued with any degree of sincerity that the capacity for scientific discovery is limited to a select few students and researchers fortunate enough to occupy a space in an R1 institution. I roundly reject this assumption. Rather, I believe in open science, inclusive science, as creating the best possible opportunity for scientific discovery, social change, and complex problem solving. I'm aware of the many arguments against open science. Who gets the credit? How are faculty incentivized? How are competitive grant dollars to be allocated and distributed? I would submit to you today that these challenges are easily solved if we first agree on the value of inclusivity. Technology has eliminated our greatest barrier. In fact, I would argue that efficient research actually depends on the availability of technological advances, openly available platforms, tools and services for scientists and researchers can only enhance the research efforts and the research efficacy. Moreover, these tools facilitate claims that science is as much based on data analytics and collaboration as it is on the efforts of a few select individuals. In fact, technology enhancements and meaningful collaboration substantially increase our ability to solve increasingly complex problems as our capacity is quite literally diversified and more importantly, multiplied. I simply refuse to accept the limited perspective that open science disincentivizes individual efforts. Rather, I believe open science increases the fidelity of research and knowledge creation, and perhaps most important, creates a multiplier effect with a diverse collective brain power is brought to bear. Each of us has a role to play. Large comprehensives, elite privates, small institutions, two-year institutions even, and minority-serving institutions alike. I believe that inquiry demands that we open our minds to the possibilities inherent in open science and its paradigm. We are operating at the tip of the spear and I am committed to forward momentum. I have joined the collaboration for open science because I believe deeply in the value of collaboration and multiple perspective to solve the problems that we face together. While we understand recognize and celebrate the unique and individual contributions of our individual scientists and researchers. We also should be open to understanding that undergraduate research, deeper engagement, widespread availability and of productivity data, of analysis and information spread broadly can assist us through input, collaboration, questioning, uh, and yes, on occasion, challenging to solve complex problems and find the right answer. There are many answers to the complex problems, but the right answers depend on collaboration, depends on diversity of thought, idea, and inclusivity in the research process. I continue to be an advocate for open science. We call it open science, we call it open research. There are many, many names, but I would submit to you that a rose by any other name smells just as sweet. The goal here is to create new knowledge, comprehensive, culturally competent, new knowledge that serves all of humanity. Won't you join me in this journey toward open science? Thank you. So let me get started by asking for response from our audience. First, Londa Schiebinger with her challenge to us. What knowledges are we relying on referring to. Who wants to come in on this? Nick. Thank you, uh, Nick Blanc, University of Leeds. So I think we heard from, from Londa and also uh, from Dawn this morning about if we want to be truly open in the way we think about how we explore whatever question we're interested in, we have to be very aware that our starting point is fixed. I come with a set of cultural baggage. Oh, hold on. Thank 
that working? Yeah, yes. perfect. I'll perfect. start again. Yeah. So Nick Plant, University of Leeds. So listening to both Londa and also Dawn this morning, I think the message I hear is that when we come to any research question, we come from a fixed starting point, and that starting point is based upon our experiences and our thoughts. And we, if we really want to have open research, if we really want to look and help to think about the way to deal with the, the large interlinked challenges we have today, then we have to look from multiple different viewpoints. And that means we have to look from not only um, ensuring diversity within research groups, but also looking from different knowledge standpoints. So people who view the whole question from an entirely different starting point. Only if we do that are we likely to really gain a holistic understanding of whatever it is we choose to study? Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Who else wants to come in? Maybe bring in our challenge by Rosalind about inclus inclusion in open research. And can I ask to see, am I, anyone online wanted to comment? No? OK, floor is yours. Who wants to come in on this? Thank you very much, Nick. And I took it, I put it straight down as a challenge. <laughs> we have one already. Great. Who can I, who would like to come in? Alan. Thank you. Um, I think this partly, partly addresses it. So one of the things which limits inclusion is access to data. Um, quite frankly, there are still too many barriers to people accessing data. Often um, repositories, archives are particularly related to storing data from a particular funder. So you have to have a grant from a particular funder in order to be able to store that data there. Other data repositories um, are essentially placed behind a paywall. So you have to have the upfront funding to be able to include your data there. Some, it might even be the situation that that is an ongoing cost. Um, so as a, as a practical uh, solution or a practical step forward to this, we could consider pooling resources within the Ken um, community to provide a open research data archive. Um, one which is not behind a paywall, one which is not particularly linked to the provision of a certain grant from a particular funder. Um, one which provides free at the point of use um, an ability for our uh, academics to upload their data to, to this um, at no cost, um, but also provides access to that data to everyone um, uh, from all institutions uh, around, around the world. Um, and critically also actually provides some support for academics to do that because it isn't just the financial barrier, it's also sometimes a, te a, a technical barrier in being able to do that um, and it comes into the to the provision of available academic time so if we can actually support our academics to do that um, if we can um, give them a, a, an encouragement to do that by giving them a provision to a service that they would not otherwise have access to uh, and the ability to use that in an efficient way I think that would be a meaningful contribution of a network like this mm -hmm. thank you great points Masood. Uh, good, good morning, afternoon, afternoon. <laughs> evening, depending on wherever you are. Uh, I'm Masood Kokar. I'm the university librarian here at the University of Leeds. <clears throat> uh, just two points from my side. I think they're both kind of high level, but um, I'm also hoping that they'll depict a level of ambition that, that really is a global ambition. I think the first thing I would say is for open research to succeed, and we've heard this from our panelists earlier, I think we also need to encourage more open knowledge communities across the globe. Communities that allow that kind of knowledge systems to come in and out of um, each other and across networks as well. And there's a whole kind of piece of research about what makes a knowledge society or knowledge system really successful. 
And ultimately, if you have an open knowledge system, I think that then by default starts leading towards more successful global open research position as well. Uh, but more interestingly, I think just picking up on Alan's point, I'm, I'm just thinking we don't think big enough. And um, one of the challenges, let's just pick on the data repository side. One of the challenges is we either think subject or we think discipline or we think national or we think long tail data, which is basically institutional. And genuinely for the big challenges to solve, as we were hearing earlier, if we really need to think transdisciplinary, I think data repositories can't be just this is genomics repository or this is um, dance or performance repository or this is something else. They really have to be thematic global repositories. And then the second thing I would say on that is if you're, if you're genuinely doing that, then let's work in partnership on that because you need people, both academic and non-academic, to come together and write stories around that data. There's no point in storing that data if nobody accesses it. I think there was a statistic I was reading that all of the world's research that we produce, research publications, 70% of that has never been read. So what, what are we trying to do this for? And if you can create those kind of stories of what this data is trying to do, bringing the kind of science and arts and other parts of it, the societal parts of it, then others can really meaningfully use that data. And I think that's where the real power comes. How can you reuse and reuse that data to generate new primary and secondary research outcomes? So I think here's an invitation to think global, think big, and be partner in it and do some real investment behind it. Yeah, awesome. thank you so much for that. We have just one from online, so that'd be wonderful to come in. And then we'll come straight to you. Yeah. Thank you. So we do have um, Sotaro who'd like to come in and make a comment. So over to you. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so I'd like to build on the discussion on diversity of knowledge systems that the uh, Professor Freshwater and also Schubinger um, referred to. And also there was a question and you know, a comment from the panel today as well. So. What I'm thinking is that maybe we may want to commit to equity and diversity of the knowledge generation system, um, which means university, researchers and faculty, you know, university. Otherwise, you know, if our knowledge generation system is biased, then we would be imposing biased knowledge to the world. And, uh, you know, which is a type of sort of knowledge colonialism. And uh, so, so, you know, my contention would be that yeah, we should include <laughs> equity and diversity of, you know, our universities as part of the, um, our knowledge generation system as, you know, to be part of our sort of um, pledge. So that's my comment. Fantastic, thank you so much. Over to you, and then I think, look, my flip chart is, Full, <laughs> then we have almost enough challenges to think about action points and narrowing it down. But what, Maria, what would you, oh, yeah? Thank you. Uh, well, my name is Javier from the University of Salamanca in Spain. Uh, regarding the idea of open research, I would, I would explain some quite a personal experience. Uh, to summarize or to, to put an example of how this should be uh, participatory and really open, my experience. My background is in development economics, and I have done some field work in Latin America, uh, gathering data, and so first, uh, financial data and social data. The problem is, in many ways, how to measure the social effects of many things, because it is difficult to gather this data. Second, uh, recalling the idea of pressure that I have felt, we have to publish this in English, really, mainly. Uh, the people who I was working with were asking me, could you please publish this also in Spanish? But even more important, the people we were working with, uh, they didn't speak Spanish. So it's a triple language problem regarding this. So how to make it open? Is it for us? Is it for the institution? Or is it for the ones who are really uh, participating in this, creating this knowledge? Thank you so much. So recognizing English is actually minority language globally. Um, which languages do we 
use? And how can we exclude language, people with different languages, and how can we include them? Absolutely. In the interest of time, I think we have a great list. Thank you so much for your contributions. And now for me is, where do you want to tackle, let, what, what is most challenging or maybe most doable as a next step? Because the brief is, let's get real and come up with distinct particular action points we can take. And we, I, if I count this correctly, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight challenges. We already have one solution. Thank you, Alan. <laughs> so I don't know whether you can see this also there at the back. So we've got multiple different pers perspectives and starting points. That was a point from Nick. We have open data. Which languages do we use? Alan's point was inclusion versus access to data. The solution was, why don't we pool the resources together through Ken and build an archive? Technical barriers were also part of this. Um, how do we encourage open knowledge systems globally? Then my suit challenge is to think big, raise awareness, give more access, and also build thematic global repositories. There was a point about creating the stories from all disciplines together. That's what I also took from you, Masu. And then the last point is equity and diversity of the knowledge generation system. So we have some really meaty challenges. The question is, which ones do we want to tackle with some concrete actions that you can all take forward in your own institutions and within Ken? Stephen, yes, please. I'm Steve Banwart from the University of Leeds. Uh, I think a very central and common point of action is creating stories from all disciplines together. I would expand that slightly, if I may, that not only all disciplines, because that seems to refer to expert knowledge from our disciplinary bias within universities, but create stories from all disciplines and also citizen experience. So that we are merging not only our knowledge coming from education systems and the systems of knowledge we bring, but also individual experience and observation from the people who are not in that disciplinary, but are living out in the world. Yeah, thank you very much, Steve. Can I have a comment? from the group. Anything from you, Emma, that online? No? Does anyone want to come back to Steve on this? Or we'll add something? Masood is giving the thumbs up. Nick, did I see you move? Thumbs up as well. Okay, great. Can I... I am forcing the discussion because I keep looking at Nick thinking I need to come up with three things. <laughs> well, but I think it's also really important, isn't it, Nick? Because, you know, it's wonderful to have those conversations, but at the end, you know, what are we going to do with that? Yes, please. Thank Matthew. you. And Ruth, you've done an amazing job with that uh, flip chart after that discussion. Um, but I, th I think um, this is not one with an easy answer, but it's easy to see steps that we can take. And I think if we don't get this particular thing right, we're going to really shoot ourselves in the foot and potentially do more harm than good. And it's about this point about diverse forms of knowledge. And um, I was really struck in the discussion this morning about just how far we've come in terms of open access around particular output types. Um, but some of the things that we're talking about, other ways of knowing that don't fit within standard research paradigms, um, we've, got, we've got an awful long way to go. Um, but my, my suggestion for an action on this would be to identify those places where those norms have already been challenged. So in my, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't introduce myself. I'm Matthew Traherne. I'm another University of Leeds person, and I'm in the arts and humanities. Um, so in my area, um, practice research is one of the places where we're having to work very hard to find ways to share knowledge. What form does knowledge take? How do you store it? How do you share it? 
Um, how do you attribute ownership of it? Really complex questions in that area. I'm not suggesting that's the only issue here, but I think practice research might give us one example where we've we've challenged the paradigms and we're having to work our way towards solutions. And I think, you know, some of the questions that Alan raised around data, right? What is knowledge? At what stage? of the research process do we start opening up data? I think the point about citizen experience is hugely important. It's kind of lived experiences. How we deal with that is really difficult, both in terms of research ethics, but also in terms of not imposing paradigms on lived experience when ways of narrating, ways of experiencing, ways of conceptualizing may be very different depending on, uh, depending on uh, context and background and so on. Um, but I think we've got, we've got some examples of where the disruption has happened. So that's my, sorry, it's very long-winded, but my suggestion for action would be that we pick out those areas where we've had to disrupt the paradigms. Um, I'm, I'm offering practice research as an example just because it's local to me, but there are, there are many other examples where that, that's taken place. Um, to see where solutions have already been found, to see where issues have already been flushed out and fleshed out, um, and, uh, and to use that as a starting point, perhaps, for, for, for some of these enormous conceptual questions around epistemology, equity of knowledge forms, and so on. Wonderful. Are you coming back to this point? Yep, great, fantastic, Claire, thank you. Hi, um, I'm Claire Knowles and I'm from the library here at the University of Leeds and I think coming on from what Matthew said and also one of the solutions in, in green, for those of you who can't see it, talks about archive and I have concerns about the word archive and that things come at the end and that's where it goes back to how if we're including people, both the citizens and di diverse forms of knowledge, it's not always at the end and it's not then things are at rest and we pick them up again and it has to be a continuum of involving people, getting people to get that feedback mechanism, sort of as what was talked about from my colleague behind me. Yep. And that's where it does mean looking at the language and how we have different forms of sharing information, and that is moving from journal articles, monographs, etc., and data sets. But what are those? All those different forms, which really comes to force when you talk yeah. to our practice-based researchers and what they're producing. Yeah. Sorry, I don't think that's an action. Or <laughs> no, but it's important, isn't it? Because I hear you loud and clear. It mustn't be an afterthought. It mustn't come in at the end. You know, it should be centrally at the beginning when we start doing the research. Great. Thank you so much. But the, I think I missed one point, a practical one from you, Claire, at the end, didn't I? Something about archive you mentioned. <laughs> okay, leave it out. Okay, who was next? Nick, and then back to Alan. And Emma, is anyone online wanting? No, we have a very small group online. Um, and then you, okay. Hello, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> I won't cough again, I promise. <laughs> Nick Shepard, also from the library at Leeds. Um, I might struggle to articulate it as a solution, but in the, in, in the context of technical, technical barriers, I mean, that's certainly a huge challenge for us in the library. Um, so it's interesting listening to Alan speak because that's kind of what we try to do in the library, but I'm a lay person, you know, as I uh, sort of tired Joe now, I say I've got a bachelor's degree in English so I can read, you know, and so I'm, I'm dealing with specialist um, research across a huge research intensive university. And I don't know my, you know, quantum physics from my, uh, you know, biological data or whatever it may be. And I need the expertise of the individuals that I'm liaising with. And I think we really need to build up that expertise and work in partnership with the, the library services in particular because we do have a sort of helicopter view you know we see we're non-specialists and that's a, a, a weakness and a strength because we see what's going on around the university and sort of empowering our service to work with the experts in the in the faculties is some way towards a potential solution I think. Yeah and Nick knowing you and Claire and our suit I know you do a lot of that already is there something else that you think is missing from what you're doing? Because I, you're doing so much outreach work already to, to work with people. What, what else is there that you think we need, you need to do? Well, as I say, I would just sort of emphasise, we've been talking recently about the idea of um, disciplinary champions or data champions, whatever you, whether you like that word or not. You know, we, we need the people with the PhDs and the experience within disciplines that we can liaise with more actively than I think we currently do to inform yeah. uh, our expertise and yep. uh, for us to inform there. Thank you. Thanks for that. 
Alan, yes, yeah, please. So I've got a, a new point, but I'll just come back on the um, point that I made previously. I, I agree, Claire, the, the word archive. It was the first word that came into my mind. <laughs> um, but um, you could choose a different word for that, which, which has a different meaning. But it, it's essentially the same, same kind of solution that I'm talking about. Um, the other point about, yes, we, we do have things within our own institutions, I'm sure, that are tried to trying to help with that. But um, again, in, the, in that spirit of thinking big, um, there's just an enormous amount of stuff that we would never really consider trying to use the library for in that context because it would just completely overwhelm you. Um, so, um, so in that sense, I think it's that thinking big is actually coming up with a kind of a comprehensive solution for something, no matter its complexity or scale, um, because, you know, um, I, the other point I, I wanted to make was was really around the open access um, point, and um, I think locally we can obviously certainly do a great deal and need to in promoting that CC by uh, inclusion, and I agree that that's a very um, proactive step forward, which is likely to yield very good results in, in that sense. Um, we do need to think about how we support our academics, who then inevitably will be faced with publishers um, trying to do things which are inappropriate um, and so we have to be geared towards supporting that but again in the context of Ken it seems to me that you we might be able to build the kind of scale of community uh, that might enable us to be ambitious in the context of um, our own vision of, of journals right within the within the Ken community you, you could you could imagine that there would be a community size that might support something along the lines of a, of a diamond, uh, open access, um, or at least you know, some other kind of subscription model with a very fair pricing structure. But you know, pooling our academic expertise means we could we could do something like that in the context of, of Ken. I'm I'm trying to come back to things which yeah. actually Ken could Ken could do absolutely deliver. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you, Ellen. Steve. Anyone online? Oh, can we just go to our online colleagues and see what they would like to bring into the discussion? And then we'll come back to you. Just have to show up your hands again, because um, I think it's Steve and two more. OK, so first of all, I've got a comment from Jackie, which she's asked me to summarise, so I'm really hoping I do my best here. We need to encourage the use of metadata or narratives around data generation by the creators to translate for lay audiences, not just across languages and disciplines. Too much data is deposited without even a README file. They're nodding in agreement. Um, and my next point is from Sotaro. So can I invite you to turn on your camera and your microphone and over to you. Thank you. Um, I forgot. I cannot turn on my video. Unable to start video. It's this. But we can hear you. OK. So I forgot to introduce myself in my last comment. I'm Sotaro Kita from University of Warwick. Um, so I'd like to build on the discussion about the role of the university libraries. And uh, so one thing that might be really useful um, is to allow input from non-university members. So at the moment, you know, people can, anybody can download things from university archives, but nobody can leave comment, commentaries on the, you know, items in the archive uh, or adding, you know, related data. So let's say there's a questionnaire in, in the archive and you translate that into Spanish and, you know, you want to add that to that, you know, data set. But, you know, non-university members cannot do this now, I think, usually. So I wonder whether you can open it up on both ways, bi-directionally. That is a question to our library colleagues, I would guess. <laughs> and we have plenty of them, thank you. Masood, who wants to come in on this? I have so many hands. Masood? I can very quickly come on this, and I'll come on this with, with the previous institution in mind and a success story. So a colleague in a previous institution submitted a data of um, mobile phone preferences and social experiment around that. And by providing some metadata, as, as was mentioned, but also by providing the citizen science aspects on people being able to add comments, commentary, other discussions, 
not only that date exploded in media coverage, but it actually was translated into 13 different languages. It People did lots of new primary research on top of that, et cetera. And it was a phenomenal story. So I think what Keita was saying and what, um, what the previous question was on metadata is absolutely uh, fundamental to allowing different knowledge systems to interact with each other. Um, I was originally going to say something else and I've now forgotten. So I will hand <laughs> my microphone to someone else and then allow yeah. that to come back at some point. Right. I am just very conscious of time. We have seven minutes and we need to agree on some actions. If you promise me to be really quick, I'll give you all a minute and then we can finish the actions off and then I think we have achieved a lot in an hour. Shall we do it like that? Okay. Yeah. Oh. yeah, I <laughs> completely agree with you. I think um, this is Claire again from the University Library here in Leeds, that having people be able to comment, that's what makes stops it in some way becoming an archive, that things grow and things become connected. And that's where... Um, I always say we've got amazing things in our hands with phones where you can take videos and you can share other things and that's where it is how do you build that network which comes I know talking to our practice-based researchers here the videos that go alongside describing it how that connects from open research into open education with connecting things together and goes back to what um, Alan was saying about a distributed maybe a federated <laughs> repository um, that can pull things together and provide those links and I think that's where looking at what that would look like and how we can make that achievable um, I don't think we're making this is where my technical background comes in and if about cloud technologies our technology behind these repositories is old um, but there's so many opportunities now of connecting things together and enabling people to do things um, with what is sitting in um, our archives at the moment great Great point, Claire, and I hope I captured it. Um, I will need some feedback from the experts afterwards. <laughs> okay, one, two, and then we can agree on the actions. Yeah, let's go to the lady first. And then Steve, it's you. Sorry, I'll be quick. Uh, I'm Chloe. Um, I'm actually from a publisher, so I'm from Frontiers, but we're an open access publisher. Um, I know we've heard a lot about kind of what publishers aren't doing today um but i think like actually there's a lot of space for us to be doing a lot more and like actually through this we can create partnerships and i think a goal really could be that we could kind of join forces and like make sure that publishers are signing on the ones that want to be part of this and that we kind of hold them accountable to doing this and as well that they can help with these things like global repositories like we have knowledge of how to kind of make data repositories and like do that so we should we should join together and like make sure that happens and really do hold people accountable to it i mean obviously with coalition s and everything and like that that really helped kind of big up the open access movement but like the open access publishers that are there we need to do more and like we need to be held accountable for that so creating these partnerships can kind of really help everybody i think yeah do me a favor it was from frontiers frontiers yes absolutely and Steve, sorry to keep you waiting. No, that's fine. There's the microphone behind you and... This is Steve Banwart again from University of Leeds. Um, I, I think this is an action or at least it's a plea. I would like to see a commitment from all members of CAN to create a plan for their institution to demystify what they do to the communities where they sit. And I'm thinking very much around the messages from President Clark Artis around open knowledge creation, open research, this idea about making it understandable. We should not have school leavers that do not understand what a university does and in transparently they can understand and compare that critically in their own way, whether that chimes with their cultural existence with their knowledge systems, but they do know clearly who we are and what we do, and that we have that two-way communication with them that we also understand our communities better. I think we each need a plan of action on that, just locally. Yeah. Thank you so much. And I think that's where I would stop your ideas from flowing, <laughs> because we have so many wonderful ones already. 
I do. Come on, Nick, you can help with that. I mean, we, but you know, it's always good to have a lot of ideas and then we can narrow them down. I mean, I try to capture the ideas for action points in green and shall we just run them through quickly? So we've got diverse forms of knowledge was, was a theme in our session. Then finding a solution, you're pooling resources in Ken and whether we call it archive or any other mechanisms, you know, we had a debate about that. One was here, you know, think big, you know, federated thematic global repositories. And we had here something about stories from all disciplines and citizens' experiences to bring this all together. That ties in with Steve's local plan, commitment from each Ken signatory to demystify what the institutions do for their community so they can really engage. Then we have something here about disrupting paradigms. Where are solutions already visible? Use what we have, that was Matthew's point. Built in partnership with library. And very concrete idea was here from Nick and his colleagues, you know, bringing in the disciplinary champions to collaborate with because they really bring that intelligence. Then we have here complex scale, build scale of Ken joining forces. I think that is really a theme coming out this afternoon, I mean, all day really. You know. Together we're stronger, how can we, how can we collaborate to make these you know, big ideas happen? And then here we have something about you know, the metadata to align different knowledge systems. And again, partnership, the word comes up again and again, partnership working with progressive publishers like Frontiers. Now, we have a long list. Which ones are the ones that you think are most doable out of all of those? And the ones that excite you. Doable is not enough for me. It also excites you because then I think we, you know, there's more drive behind getting it done. Have you got any favorites on there? Any favorites in our online community? Please. Is, I'm sorry. Um, and can you just tell us who you are? I'm, I'm Peter Lanny. I'm the uh, executive director of the Worldwide Universities Network, of which Leeds is a member, yeah. among other universities Thank present. You, One of the things that struck me about this discussion is it's ranged all, all, over all important topics, but some of them, even if you're very ambitious, far out of reach as, as, as problems to be solved in the, even in the medium term. One thing that struck me particularly was at the last point about uh, making what universities do accessible is, is actually a, a hugely important problem, uh, one that in every dimension universities would benefit from solving, and it seems to me one that, co that concerted action can actually achieve something in our lifetime. Good point, thank you very much. So, Matthew and then Nick and Alan, you also had your hand up and, and then we have to close the session. Matthew. I would really second that point because I think one, one thing that keeps going through my head is, all is uh, the example of Twitter and I'm really sorry, but it's kind of, you know, you make everything open and you, you, you take steps in that direction, but we've got a free-for-all. We don't have traditional gatekeepers. We don't want traditional gatekeepers, but then who do we have? So that demystification, that explanation, that how do you manage the volume of data, the volume of research, the volume of knowledge is going to be so critical, and it, and it could, co you know, could cause all sorts of problems. Um, I was just going to say that I think... Uh, so I think the commitment would be a really straightforward... Well, it would be easy to make the commitment, then delivering on it is another thing, of course. Um, just to say on the example that I came up with, um, which was to try and address the huge problem about forms of knowledge, but to find um, ways in which that's been worked through. I think, I think we've got some worked up examples already that will tell us both the problems and the opportunities in that space. And I think we can get to that really quickly. I don't just mean locally to Leeds, mm. I mean nationally and internationally. Um, and, and I think they can be gathered together and sort of shared with the network really quickly. Yeah. And tell me, under which point would that come for that's, you? That's the one with my name on. That's your name <laughs> yeah. on, your own. Excellent. Great. Because you're saying we have things already. We just need to collate it. Yeah. OK. Uh, <clears throat> I don't trust my voice now. Nick, Nick Shepard again from Leeds. Um, that's, the one that excites me, I guess, is um, partnerships with journals. As, yeah. um, you know, based in the library, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly guilty, I think, of a sort of us and them mentality, perhaps, um, even with the more progressive journals like Frontiers. So I think there's certainly scope there um, to partner. Yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. I can't thank you enough for making this all happen in 55 minutes minus 20 minutes of presentations. You know, this was really fast speed thinking and commitment. And we will share the findings later on in our plenary. And it's been an utter delight. And I'm learning a lot as well, um, because this is a huge topic, isn't it? But it's great to see that you came up with some very specific things we can actually do and drive. And to hear, you know, that people want to do work together, collaborate through Ken, you know, that gives you a lot of power and drive. So thank you so much for this afternoon. Have a lovely break. And then we're on to the next breakout rooms in 12 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.